Our next speaker is Bruce De Palma. You can start recording now, I guess, if you aren't. Okay, this, Bruce De Palma was born in 1935 in Orange, New Jersey, of all places. He uh, got his Bachelor of Science in MIT, and he has degrees in electrical engineer engineering and physics. Um, he's done a lot of government research and development work. He's uh, also gone to the Graduate School of Applied Physics at Harvard. He worked at Polaroid in their research department in Cambridge, Massachusetts from 1962 through 1970. He's uh, done a lot of lecturing on photographic science concurrently, and he's uh, done a lot of work at MIT Department of Electrical Engineering in the laboratory of Harold Edgerton. Um, in 1970, he began uh, the studies of uh, some of this stuff, and the invention of the end machine came in 1977. Uh, this year, he formed his own company to uh, manufacture the end machine power generation systems. So I want to welcome Bruce De Palma. Well, it's a pleasure to be here again and uh, speak to a group of interesting people about an interesting subject. I am very happy to be able to talk about the end machine because I think the end machine is finally reaching a point where enough people in the world have duplicated it and discovered its properties that people are beginning to seriously think that something good might be happening. Uh, to start, I would like to thank the Tesla Society for inviting me. And I think it's a good idea to sort of invoke the spirit of Nikola Tesla to the extent that we can. And so I brought a a copy of a paper which Tesla delivered in 1891, and it was published in the Electrical Engineer in New York, September 2nd, 1891. And this represents the state of our knowledge of the unipolar dynamo. It's a, it's a paragraph out of Notes on the Unipolar Dynamo by Nikola Tesla. And it goes, <clears throat> it is characteristic of fundamental discoveries, of great achievements of intellect that they retain an undiminished power upon the imagination of the thinker. The memorable experiment of Faraday, with a disc rotating between the two poles of the magnet, which has borne such magnificent fruit, has long passed into everyday existence. Yet, there are certain features about this embryo of the present dynamos and motors, which even today appear to us striking, and are worthy of the most careful study. Consider, for example, the case of a disc of iron or other metal revolving between the two opposite poles of the magnet, and the polar surface is completely covering both sides of the disc, and assume the current to be taken off or conveyed to the same by contacts uniformly <coughs> from all points of the periphery of the disc. Take first the case of a motor. In all ordinary motors, operation is dependent upon some shifting or change of the result of the, ma of the magnetic attraction exerted upon the armature. This process being affected either by some mechanical contrivance on the motor or by the action of currents of the proper character. We may explain the operation of such a motor just as we can that of a water wheel, but in the above example of the disc surrounded completely by the polar surfaces, there is no shifting of the magnetic action, no change whatever, as far as we know, and yet rotation ensues. Here then, ordinary considerations do not apply. We cannot even give a superficial explanation as in ordinary motors, and the operation will be clear to us only when we have recognized the very nature of the forces involved and fathomed the mystery of the invisible connecting mechanism. So this sets the tone of the state of our knowledge of the Faraday disk, the homopolar generator, the end machine, things like that. But long before I ever thought about end machines and electrical generators, I studied rotation. And to start off, let's have the first slide here. And we go on that. I guess I'm the one that presses the button. Okay, so much. Go back. It doesn't go back. You gotta reverse it on the machine. Okay, reverse it back. Okay, this is a machine called a force machine. And it's a machine for studying forces. Now, in physics, we have many physical theories uh, which we use. <coughs> like Einstein's theories, the theories of thermodynamics, the theories of Einstein, as applied to the motion of the planets. We have various paradigms which form the basis of these theories, like the paradigms of uniform 
motion versus re the absolute motion versus relative motion, paradigms of symmetry, paradigms of conservation, paradigms of equivalence, and all of these ideas help us to look a little further into nature, but no one of these ideas seems to describe all the phenomena. So coming into this situation in 1970 as a physicist looking at the situation of the world and the problem of the diminishing of resources and the consumption of the oil, I said to myself, there is no answer in conventional science for our energy problem. So, and I was agreed with by all the other great minds at the time. So, I said to myself, well, there must be some way of looking at the facts that we already know through a different way, a different paradigm, and that might help us to do a different experiment, which will lead to new knowledge. Now, one of the ideas I had, and maybe we can bring the lights up for just a second on this one here. Is that, yeah. I thought to myself, what would happen if we looked at physical phenomena from the point of view of perfection? What would that mean? Now, for instance, we know if we have a force, that this force has a magnitude and a direction. And it has a direction. Now, is that all it has? In classical physics, this is all it's supposed to have. But if we look at this pure thing, this pure force with only magnitude and direction, and ask ourselves, well, what would happen if it wasn't perfect? What would the nature of the imperfection of a force be? Now, if a force possesses magnitude and direction, my logic was that the, imp the imperfect part of something which is purely directional and had purely magnitude was something that has no direction. And the only quantity that I could think of that was totally non-directional was inertia. And so what that said to me was that if we manifested a large force, we might also manifest at the same time some inertial property, which we would have never looked for before had we not had the idea of perfection Perfection. That's on candid camera. Uh, if we had the idea of perfection, then we could call this quantity, which was imperfect, the defect of forces. Okay? And the defect of forces in my logical world had an inertial property associated with it. Now, going back to the first slide again. Let's see how we can test this idea. So I made this apparatus, and the apparatus consists of two flywheels in a cylinder, and they're mounted in such a way as the flywheels are rotating in opposite directions. In the same plane, the axles are perpendicular to each other, and the whole precision of the apparatus is to about a half ten thousandths of an inch, so that in any motion of this cylinder as it's rotated in bearings on either side, no forces developed by the flywheel can appear in the axis of precession, because they're all at right angles, i.e. that when you precess the gyroscope in this situation, the axles tend to tilt this way, and so the two top axles would press together, and the two bottom axles would pull apart, and you'd set up these forces in the walls of the cylinder. And so just simply by turning this apparatus, we create a situation where all the gyroscopic forces are canceled out, so you have an object in which you can experiment on rotation without the interference of the gyroscopic forces. And as you process the machine, forces are developed in the walls, and no reaction torque appears in the axis. Now, let's go to the next slide. This is what it looks like in reality. There are two motors, uh, each one driving one side of the axle there, the way the flywheels look inside. This, unfortunately, is upside down, but that's how the, uh, that's how the, the motors and the bearings are situated on the flywheels, so to, pretend, to make the whole thing high precision. <coughs> two, two, two needle bearings on either side, and one ball bearing on the top of the bottom. 
Now, if you do an experiment with this apparatus, and you, you cause it to precess, and the drum of the cylinder to rotate at velocity revolutions per second, 3.8 revolutions per second, we found that if you allow it to slow down into a very massive load, such that it was not affected by vibration or any temperature effect or anything, that it took longer for the cylinder to slow down when the flywheels were rotating inside than it did when they weren't. And there's about a 14% increase in the inertial mass of a processing gyroscope in this experiment. Now this is very, very interesting because the only way that inertial mass is supposed to change is at light speed velocities and close to it. Here's an effect which is going on at very low speeds. These are going 10,000 RPM and processing at 3.8 revolutions per second. So this is in the range of, of mechanical velocities which can be achieved on the Earth. And here's a picture of the machine now hanging in my laboratory in California. And here you can see that you can experiment on a rotating object by having the gyroscopic forces canceled. You can collide this thing with something. You can swing it back and forth as a pendulum. You can play it. You can do all manner of experiments on rotating objects which have never been done before. So having constructed this apparatus, I have to then proceed to start doing experiments with it. The first one was the precession experiment. And the second one, and here is what happens if you process a little bit too fast and you crack off the one inch, put a little sharper focus back there. There you go. These are one inch diameter tool steel axles on there and the flywheel weighs 30 pounds. And if you process too fast, they snap right off. 